Good evening, everybody. It is great that you are joining us this evening. I am so looking forward to this conversation. My name is Lou and I lead the pastoral care team at Christchurch London. And as a church, we really care about emotional well-being and mental health. And this is why we are running a number of seminars over these months, all about health and well-being, anxiety, um, stress. We've done one on sleep. You can check them all out on YouTube. And this evening, I am delighted to be chatting to Dr. Roger Bretherton. Roger is a clinical psychologist and a lecturer at the University of Lincoln, and he has so much wisdom to share. So welcome, Roger. Hello, Lou. It's absolutely lovely to be with you this evening. Ah, oh, likewise, likewise. Um, and one of the reasons I've been so ex excited about speaking to you is because I think when it comes to the topic of joy, there is so much out there about you know, buy this, it'll make you happy or do this, or you just need to do this and that. And I think I'm just, I just think it's so refreshing to speak to someone who has researched this and you do this as your job. You, you look at how people tick and why people do the things they do. So I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. That sounds great. <laughs> And just to say, if you're watching this and you have questions yourself, we would love to hear them. I have my phone with me and Lydia, um, who is monitoring the social media, is going to let me know if there, anyone has any questions. So please do feel free to ask them. No question is stupid. Um, and Roger would love to answer these questions as well. So I guess one thing that's important to ask at the beginning is what joy is, because I guess a number of us might have a different interpretation of what joy is. So can we start there? Yeah, well, so, so the thing is that joy sits in, in positive emotions. Uh, so there's a whole range of what psychologists would call positivity. And uh, I mean, the first thing we have to say is that the, there are no good and bad emotions as such, that all our emotions are trying to do something for us. So even the bad emotions anger, anxiety, guilt, etc., trying to accomplish something for us. But when we talk about the good emotions, what we're talking about, we're talking about those emotions that on, on the one hand, they, they broaden our awareness of who we are and what's around us in the world. So when, when you're feeling good, you become more open to the world around you. And then secondly, they build our resilience. So if you have a moment of uh, loving feeling, joyful feeling, serenity, whatever, and then uh, a difficult thing occurs, some stress or some anxiety comes in, you'll actually be much more resourceful, much more resilient in how you deal with that, that thing that comes forward. So joy usually is viewed as the emotion that, that accompanies some kind of gain in life. So when something new comes your way, something you know, exciting in some way. And this is why sometimes it's associated with things like shopping. Uh, shopping is an interest, and we will we'll have to come to that in a second because it, it's okay. not the best <laughs> example of it. Um, but, but if you really think about really deep, profound joy, what we're talking about is we're talking about those moments where something happens that adds to our personal domain. In other words, it, it touches us in that really, really deep place in our hearts. And there's almost like an inner yes that goes, yes, that's me. Yes, that's what I'm about. There's a sort of motivational positivity to it. And it leads to approach. So, so the things that we find joyful are the things we want more of. We want to approach and we want to look at them in some way. Wow. That is amazing. Just thinking of it like that, I'd never... I'd never thought of it that way. And just going back to what you said right at the beginning um, about good and bad emotions, I think that's a really important point because I think it's very easy to feel kind of almost guilty about having bad emotions or being angry at having them. And you can just feel like, oh, it's just a waste of time being angry or sad or something. But just to draw on that point, I think that, that is really helpful to know, actually. It's it's really important, isn't it? And, and particularly recently with, with lockdown and probably with quite a difficult autumn and winter ahead of us as well, um, it, I think it's really important that we don't make negative emotions, if you like, wrong. Um, what's interesting about negative emotions, as I sort of implied, is that negative emotions, unlike positive emotions, 
have really strong action tendencies attached to them. So fear wants to run away, shame wants to hide, sadness wants to withdraw, anger wants to fight. And it's because they're, they're there, they're designed to do something for us really, really quickly. Um, and I think the difficulty for a lot of us is that over the period of lockdown and perhaps going into the next season as well, I think we're going to find that we're in those negative emotional states and they're designed to try and solve a problem for us very, very quickly. But actually, it's a problem that can't be solved. You know, it's not going to vanish. We're not you know, we don't have control of our lives quite often at the moment. And so I think to, the thing to be really, really clear about is in those moments, just remember, it's perfectly reasonable to be sad, to be scared, to be resentful or guilty. Those kind of things kind of make sense, given the context that we're in. Um, but but not to confuse those things with our identity. So, so I think what, what's happened to a, a lot of people during this period of time is that you go from feeling negative because that, that's the way things are. And then suddenly you turn it into a, a strong position on yourself. So you start saying, oh, I knew I was useless. I knew I was hopeless. These kind of things already happened to me. I knew I was unlovable. I knew I couldn't do my job. And then suddenly we start taking all these really, really strong positions. And so I would say the best thing to do with negative emotion is to say, what is this emotion trying to do for me? And how can I just validate if that's what it's trying to accomplish? But unfortunately, right now, it might not be able to accomplish that. So let's sit with the emotion rather than turning it into a statement about ourselves. So put that, give me an example of what you would do that with. So say I am feeling like we've just gone into um, high, the, the next tier up. So now we can't have any people in our home. So say as, well, it is actually the case. I've been feeling really sad about that because I'm missing the people interrupting action how could you apply that to that situation so it's so the way i would apply it to there is it is firstly let's validate the sadness so of course you feel sad mm. and one of the things that's really lovely about you being sad is it means that you really deeply valued the people who came to your home so hold on to that hold on to that gratitude um so that's validating the emotion saying it's perfect you've lost something and it's something that's really important to you and nurture that think about it make phone calls you know make sure that that thing that you you lost you're really clear on but then what sometimes happens is you go from them feeling sad and then gradually what happens is that that emotion starts to bleed and smear itself over time so you then start feeling scared about being sad and then you feel guilty about being sad and then you feel you know it just goes on and on and on and on and and i i would say that that's the bit to notice when that's beginning to happen and try to go back to the original um kind of the original feeling there, there was a good example that that occurred um, with me and my wife during the first part of lockdown where um if i feel sad if i feel helpless it's really easy to flip into blaming somebody else so my head was starting to what was annoying me about her and what was going on and what we needed to do differently. And I started a conversation that that went something like, you know, this would be so much easier if you wouldn't do boom, 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 boom. And, uh, and Marie Claire, my wife, was pretty quick and she just went, Roger, let's not do that now. Hey, I know I know that you feel, you know, I know that like all of us, you feel helpless and you feel scared and you feel guilty. But how about we don't blame each other for what's happening right now? And, and she was absolutely right. What happened to me is I was feeling sad and scared and helpless. And I'd sort of leveraged that into this will be much easier if I can just blame her for it. And she was going, let's not play that game because it's going to take us to places we don't want to go. And she was absolutely wise right. Women. Wise women. I know. I, know. <laughs> I, just, I just hope I'm that level headed <laughs> where people do the same to me. And so I think that's so so important what you said about how we can kind of almost inflate the negative emotions that are going on in our mind to make them bigger and I don't know if this is true for anyone else watching I suspect it is but quite often with joy I almost min like I find that the the moments of joy can be so fleeting and and yet the moments that are say more negative emotions they can feel like they last longer why is that? So we, we have a natural negativity bias as human beings, um, which means that that basically we are primed to look for problems and for negativity in, in any context. Like in really minor ways, you really notice this if you get a bit of feedback at work, for example, and there's three wonderfully positive things and one negative thing. It's not the positive things that give you the sleepless night about how wonderful you are. It's the negative thing. And what should I do about that? 
And, and, and there's a good reason to emphasize those things, because those are the things that are a threat to our social standing, they're a threat to our safety, they're a threat to our relationships, and therefore we just have this natural tendency to aim at those things. But when, when we start to talk about the area of psychology I work in, which some people call character strengths, which is how do we develop hope and gratitude and love and wisdom and all, all the good stuff, how do we do that? There, there is an awareness that when you start thinking in those ways, you are pushing against the grain of who we are naturally as human beings. But, but we're doing exactly what you're saying is that we're beginning to take those tiny moments sometimes of gladness, of joy, those sort of moments of light in the darkness that we sometimes see, and we're magnifying them. So some people call it savoring. In other words, you just pick it up and you remember it and you enjoy it and you revisit it and you perhaps write about it as you're drifting off at night. You, you're thankful in bed for those moments. And what we're doing is we're intentionally pushing attention towards those good things in life because we won't naturally do it so this is why so many people encourage you to to keep gratitude journals or kind of listing things that you're thankful for is to almost build the muscle of the contentment muscle almost yeah that, that's right so so one of the things I find when people first start doing this is sometimes they struggle to think of one good thing in their day, you know, particularly if, if you have a tendency towards depression or anxiety, it can be really difficult to think what was good today because you immediately go to all the things that went wrong or where the problem was or those kind of things. Um, but, but what, for example, gratitude di writing a gratitude diary, writing a gratitude journal really does is it gets you used to spotting those things. Um, and, and then the other thing I really like doing is when I'm talking about psychological strengths, beginning to spot the good things in yourself so that you become just as au fait, just as familiar with what's good about you as you are with all the things that are wrong with you, <laughs> all the things that you want to change and want to alter. Um, and, and that we should, re if we want to really live a sort of balanced life, we should really be, have just, well, half a vocabulary that's just as rich, just as wonderful for the good things about us and the people around us as we do about the problematic things. I think that is so important in a culture where collectively we have such low self-esteem to, to actually not be embarrassed or afraid about recognising the good things in us. Yeah. Because uh, I guess, and I'm sorry if I think here, but kind of Brits can be quite, oh, no, no, kind of self-deprecating. Yeah. But I can see that actually being open, being honest about our strengths as well, how that could be really good for us. Well, well I, I think sometimes what happens is we have, we have a prejudice against ourselves almost in the way that we'd have a prejudice against a particular people group. You know, this counts for everybody else, but not me. Um, and then I think if we're really honest, there's a part of us that sort of feels that it's almost morally wrong, maybe, or even socially dangerous to believe good things. You know, what would it be like if you believed you were kind and you accidentally let that slip out? Oh, all hell would break loose, that kind of thing. But but actually, it's really, really important that, that we spot those things in ourselves, even if we recognise they're sometimes quite small, not particularly dramatic, not particularly exciting. But, but the, the model of character I, I sort of work on is basically a seed model of character, which says the best way to grow wisdom, courage, gratitude, love in yourself isn't to go, where's that gone? Where can I find it? It's to spot the seeds of those things in you and begin to water them. So, again, just being really practical, how would you do that? So, so first thing is what we're talking about, which is the awareness. So you have to be able to spot them, first of all. Um, I, and if we're really good, we, we should be able in any 20 minutes of our life, any 20 minutes of our experience, you should be able to spot small good things that, that are part of you and are good. So, second thing to do is then explore them. OK, when has that been a theme? When have I done that before and before that and before that? And, and what's happened in my life when I've been kind or when I've been brave or when I've persisted or those moments when I showed great wonder or great self-control and just really explore where have those things, where have they been in the past? And, and then the third thing is apply them. It's almost like begin to think, how today could I use 
that lovely quality in myself you know what what new curious kind way could i be wise again today or show good thinking today or um gratitude or wonder or hope how how could i put those things into practice today? just one way you know you don't have to go over the top in it um so so that that's the kind of model that a lot of psychologists would talk about so it's awareness exploration of what does this thing mean in your life and then application how could i just now now that i know that's part of me how could i use that in lots of different places and i, I just before i finish on this i should also say that, that that is one of the most reliable ways ways to increase positive emotion in us as human beings is to work out what's good in you and find a way of using that every day yeah. which which really um highlights how important it is to take time to self-reflect in in a culture where we are very good at doing 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 it's it's not always easy or doesn't always come naturally to us to take that time to reflect on okay what's what's gone well for me today what have i done well where you know what qualities would i like to keep working on that's right that's yeah really important I and I think some of that is because we, we quite often we're looking outside of ourselves to decide what to do next and what has to be done and what's necessary. Whereas I think when you step into reflection, when, when you reflect and for some people that that will be a meditative or even a prayerful exercise at times. Um, very often when we're reflecting, what, what's happening is we're, we're, we're sitting in the artistry of living. We're beginning to say, what would it mean to live this? Uh, and it's almost like you start to feel the joy and the hope of what it means to live some of those wonderful qualities in everyday life. Yeah, definitely. And um, just to say, if you have recently joined us, then a big welcome from us. Roger and I are having a conversation on finding joy in difficult times. Roger is a clinical psychologist and a university lecturer at Lincoln University. And we have been talking a lot about negative emotion and joy and how we can cultivate feelings of joy and one question I've just thought of is like why as humans why do we even long for joy why is it something that so many of us chase after in either healthy forms or unhealthy forms like what is it about it yeah I and I, I think there's two things mixed up in in that question as well so, so let, let's just Firstly, just talk about the unhealthy forms, because I know you've mentioned shopping already and it's worth us kind of just talking about <laughs> that as well. Oh no, um, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't I don't by any stretch of the imagination think you're addicted to buying shoes or anything like that. But but it, it's worth, it's worth talking about. Um, so, so psychologically, we talk about two kinds of happiness quite often. So we talk about hedonic happiness, which is the happiness that really just comes from pleasure. Um, and then there's eudaimonic happiness, which is the happiness that comes from living a good life, if you like. Um, and and the, the true idea of kind of thriving, flourishing, what you might call the fullness of joy really lives in the eudaimonic side of things. So it lives in that sort of feeling of I'm living a good life and somehow grace and love and all these wonderful things come with knowing how to live well. So that's kind of eudaimonic happiness. And that that's what we're probably going to talk about most. But. But it's worth talking about the hedonic side of things, because firstly, it's not wrong to have pleasure, enjoy a new car. You know, that, that's all great. The difficulty with it is that that um, th there's something slightly deceptive about it. So so we tend to assume that, that when we're imagining buying something, let's say that, that it will make us happier than it actually will and that that happiness will last longer than it actually does. Um, and so what happens is let, let's imagine you were addicted to buying shoes Lou. <laughs> uh, and you, you can't wait to buy your next pair of shoes you get those pair of shoes for a week you love them and you're strolling about in them but then after a while that begins to teeter off and go down and then you have to buy your next pair of shoes so you feel the same again and then the next and then the next and then the next and so you can see how sort of for a lot of us this is how advertising and materialism gets us really um and and psychologists call that the hedonic treadmill in, in other words it's this idea of chasing after the next pleasurable thing and the next pleasurable thing and the next hit and the next hit and it goes goes on like that um now now interesting gratitude is one of the ways that we can short circuit that because what happens when you're grateful for something 
grateful for your home grateful for your lovely shoes you know grateful for your car you know talk about material things we can also talk about our family and friends and all the things we can be grateful for when you're grateful for something it's almost like you receive it as a gift again as if for the first time it's like you look at it again with fresh eyes and go oh thank you so much i really appreciate that i'm so glad for that and so and so that's why when we talk about eudaimonic uh so pleasure well-being if you like we're, we're talking about what happens when we live a good life and gratitude and love and hope are all part of that sort of way of living which ultimately is where the deeper joy lies um I, I, a friend of mine once said that advertising strips us of our dignity and sells it back to us at the price of the product and um in a sense, I think sometimes what happens in life, we're being pulled all over the place in all kinds of different directions. And we think that various things are going to bring us joy. But then when we finally get them, they they don't quite. And I think that's when we start asking the question, OK, what, what kind of life should I be living that, that would lead to a sort of sustained sense of enjoyment, rejoicing, gladness? Um, some people even call it humour, playfulness, maybe. So oh, there's so much in that, so much if we if deep down we all want to pursue that longer lasting sense of joy and not the kind of up and down like I know exactly what you mean I mean I do love shopping but also my phone usage social media I feel like you know you know it's the dopamine hit and then it tails off if what deep down we are searching for that deeper level of joy I don't even know what my question is really I guess it's more uh just an acknowledgement that we are it does seem like often we look for it in the wrong places yeah. yeah as a culture we do and so it's hard not to get swept up in that isn't it yeah and I mean the thing I, I found interesting about lockdown for me anyway it is that I found that that sort of that first pause that came in March initially occurred to me as a real frustration as like you know there's so many things I had to do so many different things that were going on kids were at home being homeschooled so suddenly all these goals that I had ironed out and they all went in different directions they kind of worked and worked together didn't just all kind of collapse because they all just collided with one another all in the same house all at the same time it's very very difficult frustrating so I sort of went through anger and sort of guilt I was letting everybody down and then through a sadness of having to let them go and here's the weird thing when you hit that sadness and you let some of those go you suddenly realize that you're relieved and you're like actually not even sure why I was pursuing promotion in, in the way that I was pursuing I'm not quite sure why I was pursuing publishing in that way I'm not quite sure why I really thought I had to teach my kids in that way and actually there's lots of other ways of doing it um and so so the first thing to say is I think that for many of us the lockdown has been that almost like I mean we talk about circuit breaker but it felt like a circuit breaker for our souls really yeah. in terms of like you know what I've been pursuing a bunch of stuff that actually I don't think is very good for me and if I'm really honest it doesn't give me a deep sense of joy um, and then you can begin a sort of hopeful quest for well what does you know what what is more important than all of this I'm going to come back to that because I think that is a really important point about kind of that quest for meaning and purpose and longer term joy. I have a whole load of questions I've been messaged in. Okay. So I'm just going to go through them and we could do um, some of these. OK, so could you talk a little bit about the experience that joy cult about the experience that joy cultivates energy, but at the same time that it at times takes energy to get joy? What do you do when energy levels are really low? And that's, an, I, I guess maybe this person's talking about kind of, you don't have enough energy to find joy in things. So how do you kind of yeah. cultivate that? Yeah, yeah. So, so that that's quite, that that's actually a very, very profound question. I feel like I, I, I'm probably going to answer it quite inadequately, but let, let me give it a shot because I'm thinking about all the research on energy and then I'm thinking about where joy goes, you know, so let, let, me, let me give it a shot and, and I, I'm probably going to miss some of the details of it, but let me try anyway. Um, so so the, the, the first thing I would say is that there is a sense that joy is a kind of energy in and of itself. Um, and, and it tends to, it, it, it almost like it occurs to us rather than us pursuing it. So, uh, 
one of the ways of looking at joy is it's almost like joy is the radar that goes off when you know you've found what what you love doing or, or what you enjoy or what's really deeply valuable to you. So so from a psychological, emotional point of view, if you think about the cycle of emotions, which goes from things we value highly, that's joy. So when you get the things you value highly, you experience joy. When you're furthest away from them, you're in sadness. So that that's the kind of cycle of emotion. And the other thing to say is that um, it is that very often we experience joy when we gain someone. Uh, but but that's almost the moment that joy starts to fade. Then so then we go into the sort of the downward cycle for a while as well. So the, we can't always stay in joy. The the other thing that I think is really interesting in that question is that that what you find is that um, our joy in the world, at what's around us, the world becomes much more vivid and enjoyable to us when our inner lives come alive. So sometimes what's happening is we're burnt out and we're weary within. And that means that we've sort of lost it. We've sort of lost connection with those things that give us joy. And I think if anyone finds themselves in that situation, it, it's just worth just reflecting back. E even if you have to go you know, a few months back or even a year back, just think about when was the last time you felt really deep, right to the bone, joyful satisfaction in something and just have a think about what that was so so this is where the question you asked earlier about reflection is really important you know reflecting on our moments of joy just gives us a clue on where might joy be for us right now so I hope that just touches on it a little yeah, bit really helpful yeah. and i can definitely from my own experience i've had that i've had depression in the past and you just not saying this is but in my experience, when I had a time of low mood for a sustained period of time, it's really hard to find joy in the everyday things. And it just is really tough. I, I, I would also say let's not make joy a demand as well. You know, so, you know, for people who are depressed, um, often feel sometimes don't even feel sad, just feel deeply numb and unresponsive inside. So let's not add to that terrible feeling that the guilt that you're supposed to be more joyful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> let's not put that in there too yeah. um but rather let's just acknowledge that's where you are now and uh, and if you want to reflect back on what joy was like in the past that might give a little bit of a guide to where to go next yeah but not force it upon yourself yeah, yeah. great um next question how do you stop being scared about the future and feeling like that kind of feeling of impending doom like something bad is going to happen yeah yeah man are you feeling that too that's how yeah. I see it. <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> um, what's what's about to happen next um let let, let me um let, let me use an analogy that some psychotherapists use that, that i find really helpful on this um so it's there there's a, a parable in in a form of psychotherapy called act acceptance and commitment therapy and it says that your mind is like a, an old style radio with two dials on it and in a moment of anxiety, worry, fear, whatever, um, your, your, your kind of your volume dial is turned up to 11 and you just can't stop it. You know, no matter what happens, you know, that heightened sense of something terrible is going to happen is is around you. But but what we can move is we can still move the tuner. You know, the tuning dial can still be mo moved up and down. So you can't take away the anxiety because, to be honest, right now you'd be very, very you know, accurate to be apprehensive about what's going on. But what we can do is begin to get curious and begin to get really psychologically flexible about how we might want to deal with some of those fears. So sometimes even I, I will sometimes even play a game with myself where I'll say, what, what's the worst that could happen uh, realistically? You know, not in my imagination, but what, what's the what's the worst outcome that could come in the next few months and what resources are in me? to deal with that you know almost like take myself to that moment and then imagine myself in spite of all that terrible stuff happening dealing with it really well because quite often when we're in that sort of that cycle of worry and um, the, the 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 thing I, i've just had another thought that that i should probably go to firstly let me say this so worry you know worry and curiosity are the same thing so when you're curious about something you say I don't know what's going to happen next and you just get really curious about it it could be this could be that could be the other could be the other when you're worried about something you say this is uncertain but i've got to get rid of that uncertainty that uncertainty bad so you take that tiny negative thing and you just proliferate all these possibilities around it so curiosity is one of the best ways to deal with worry 
is actually begin to think what what are all the possible futures that might be coming your way just have a think about some really good ones all those kind of things and then the other thing is actually to think about yourself so this is where i was going with the worst possible scenario is really begin to invest in imagining what's really strong and really good and really strategic and really artful and skillful in you that actually when the worst does happen we'll deal with it we'll work it up because you just will you know you'll find a way around it and imagine yourself so the answer in that sense to worry isn't necessarily trying to deal with the thoughts it's actually bringing it back to who am i and what will i remain committed to no matter what happens you know what are the skills that i have because the other thing to say is that when we're in negative emotions many of our skills are state-based which means that when you feel sad anxious angry some of our skills suddenly vanish we can't find them anymore and one of the things to do when you're feeling anxious is just remind yourself those things are still there. You are still that person. There is still some competence. There is still some skill in you, even if right now you feel like you haven't seen it for a while. So it's almost kind of building confidence in yourself in the state you are. And it also what you're saying, which I just found really helpful, is about curiosity and worry and actually that almost takes the shame out of anxiety and worry if if you kind of turn it on its head and almost it's a it's a it's the same kind of muscle almost it is but but if you think about it so worry is is a way of trying to solve a problem and the problem is i don't know what's going to happen next so i'm going to create all these different ways of doing it um Whereas you could say, why not do that curiously instead? Like, let, let me think of all the ways I could solve this situation. If the worst happens, all the different ways that I could do it. And then you put yourself in a much more resourceful, creative space. And, and let's be clear, it's not easy to do that. But but it, but it it's just saying that worry is a bit of, worry is like your mind spinning, trying to solve a problem it can't solve. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, how do you help someone who is feeling pretty miserable and unfulfilled yet at the same time seems unwilling or unwanting to change it's like they dream about something different but at the same time seem to depend on the reality they know which is a lot more negative yeah so, so the, this is kind of the the really deep question particularly around um perhaps if you're living or caring with or or even treating someone who's depressed very often you'll find that that, that you're presented with that that kind of scenario where someone is clearly in a very very down depressed kind of state but at the same time they almost sort of resist being helped on some mm. level so you, you're presented with those two dynamics at the same time um I, and it is it is really difficult to know how how do you get in there and, and what do you do and so so i i i mean there's so many different places to go there but but i i, I guess my first thing would be to, to validate the negative emotion so sometimes what happens is with a depressed person, you get into a tug of war where you want them to move on and they don't want to move on because part of the depression is actually there's something really important for me going on here. And I don't want someone just to slap me around the head and say you're wrong and move on. You know, if I if I could just pull up my socks and move on, I would. But actually, there's something more profound than that going on. So, so the first thing I, I would say is is let's bring some acceptance to that emotional state. And then if if the conversation is available about moving on, that, then I would say, what what's the smallest step you feel capable of doing? So rather than me coming up with what I think they should do, what's the smallest step you can do? It. So I, I think of a client of mine I had um, who suffered a profound depression for many, many years and was still depressed, actually, after seeing me. So it wasn't even that I healed him or cured him in, in the process. But one of the things that he got more and more depressed about was the state of his bathroom. And um, he he was quite skilled with DIY. So basically, we came up with this deal where he would tile one tile in his bathroom every day. <laughs> so ridiculously slowly, really, from any objective point of view. But you know what? At the end of six weeks, he had an absolutely beautiful bathroom. And and that that would be my view. On the one hand, accept that's just the way things are. On the other hand is there any movement any movement at all tiny steps even tiny steps over a long period of time can still lead somewhere quite nice so that's so that would be very kind of it's a very provisional sort of mm -hmm. inadequate answer in some ways but it's basically those two things acceptance and then just tiny steps forward that's 
I really love that illustration because it's so often we can think, okay, I'm here and I want to be over here and you just see a big kind of gap yeah. in between. But that idea of taking little steps, like one tile a day, like one little step a day can help you get there. That's a really nice illustration. Yeah. So we talked earlier about um, things that can bring a short-term joy. Um shopping <laughs> or you know lo lots of things like short-term hits actually let's just talk about a few of what they are there's give me some alcohol yeah eat, eating it's a classic one watching tv so box sets and <laughs> yeah netflix um which is actually a lot about lots of people when lockdown started it was all about you know, Netflix and chill, basically, yeah. to kind of get through it. It's like medicating on TV, um, phone, social media. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, for some people, actually, work. So for some people, I have a tendency towards being a bit obsessive around working. Working becomes the thing that they can't can't disengage from. And and so why do some of these or all of these things? Why well, is it that they only bring short-term joy or can people get ultimate fulfillment through some of these things? So so I, I think when I look at it, I mean, again, this is it's such a complex question. Like, how am I going to possibly answer that question <laughs> um, right now? Um, so so, so there's, there's kind of two, two thoughts that come to mind about it. It's that basically when you look at the research on flourishing, fulfillment, thriving, etc. Um, most people now seem to think that there's sort of five things that really give us a sense of joy, if you like, and goodness. And it, effectively, they boil down to, um, you know, things that give us positive emotion. So that's some of the things that we're talking about. There's nothing wrong with them. They, they only become a problem if we become obsessed with them or they become addictive in some way. But then uh, things that engage us, so really great hobbies, great conversations, moments where time, time flies because we've got really absorbed in something we really enjoy, playing music, whatever. And things that are deeply meaningful to us. So things that make us go, that that's great. And um, things that give us a sense of achievement. So even if it's, you know, doing the housework, you don't like doing it, but once it's done, you, you look at the house and you're really, really pleased with it. Um, and, and then our, our relationships. So, so high positive connections we make with other people and the difficulty that we're talking about if you think about all those things those five things put together is that we're, we're thinking about one category so it's so if you just want things that give you positive emotion and you ignore you know engagement relationships meaning achievement it's like putting all your eggs in one basket and 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 then basically when that basket stops working for you, you just start putting more and more eggs in it. And that's when it becomes a problem. It becomes addictive. It becomes obsessive and those kind of things. So it's not really that those things are inherently problematic as long as they're in the right place. But it's just if that's the only thing we've got going on, um, that that's when when the trouble starts. Basically, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's yeah, <laughs> where it's going. In. No, it definitely does. Yeah. And yeah. Changing tact a little bit, you've obviously done lots of research on joy and other kind of character traits. What What's formed your own perspective on joy, would you say? That That's a really good question. So, I mean, I'm unusual as a psychologist, really, in the sense that, um, so I'm a practitioner, as you've heard, a clinician. Um, but, but I'm also um, a Christian, so I'm interested in the theology of all these kind of things. And then I'm also a researcher, so I'm actually, you know, crunching the stats and trying to find out what works and, and what, what what doesn't work and things like that. Um, and so, so given that it's the more unusual piece, let, let me just start with some of the, the theological side of things and then we'll talk about the science because they're really weirdly interesting, interestingly connected. Um, so, so as a Christian, when I think about joy, and I often go into the into the Bible to kind of look at it, it is that what's interesting is that some of the greatest moments of joy in the biblical story don't come when people are sat on a beach drinking a pina colada. I mean, I don't think that really happens in the Bible at any point. But, um, you know, the the kind of 
the the story about um, Paul the Apostle. Um, he he writes an entire letter to a, a church in Philippi in which he just bangs on about joy all the way through it. And basically he's writing from prison. So he's writing about joy from his own experience of lockdown, being confined, not being able to pursue anything, not being able to do anything. It's like he has this huge, overwhelming joy. Um, similarly, there's a story in the Old Testament that's the, it's in the first book of the Bible in Genesis that that's all about a couple that can't have children. So Abraham and Sarah, you know, famous story. And um, basically that that story is full of laughter all the way through it. So to begin with, God says you're going to have a child. They laugh. Then uh, so Abraham laughs then Sarah laughs. But in the end, it's almost like God has the last laugh because they have a child and they call the child Isaac. He who laughs. Um, and, and so if I was just going to go purely from the sort of Christian biblical perspective, I, I, I love this idea of joy and laughter and playfulness and humor often not belonging to the moments where everything's fine, but quite often belonging to the moments where we feel oppressed, we feel things are difficult, we feel confined, that those are the moments when joy really, really counts. Mm. It's interesting because you wouldn't normally associate science and Christian faith, but yet you're seeming to suggest that there's a link, there. They kind of there's an interplay between the two of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think that the, the kind of clash between science and religion is a bit overplayed, really, in my opinion. You know, I, I don't it's only really people on the extremes of the, the spectrum who argue with one another. Most people are somewhere in the middle. and I guess I'm somewhere in the middle as well. That you know, I, I really enjoy the dance between science and data uh, and perhaps spiritual experience in Christianity in, in my my sort of experience. Um, but, but I think joy might be a good example, actually, because when you start to look at the research on, well, well, interesting, the psychology of joy, one of the places to look is actually looking at all the studies that have been on, done on humour, where humour isn't just comedy, just having a laugh about something. Humour is the general cheerfulness and kind of uproarious way of approaching life that, that comes when you have a sense of humour. And there's all this fascinating, fascinating research on um, the way in which, for example, laughter helps us reprocess and reframe stressful events how people who have a positive sense of humor in other words a sense of humor that that builds relationships with other people and enhances them that those people you know see reductions in depression in anxiety improved relationships with other people that the research that's done on couples for example where um you find that um if a couple can use humor in a sensitive and an appropriate way that it's been associated with them overcoming all kinds of things like diagnoses of cancer, uh, struggling to, to have children. Um, it, th there's even one lovely piece of research where they looked at how um, uh, one partner's sense of humor, their ability to appropriately make the other laugh predicts um, marriage success six years down the road. <laughs> and so there's all these kind of really, really sort of strange and, and I'm literally that that just like a few of them. Like, I mean, there were literally hundreds of these that have been done. Um, so interesting, this kind of idea that joy, humor, playfulness, laughter can be a real help to us in moments of stress and adversity has been shown over and over and again, scientifically, as well as the sort of biblical stories I just mentioned. Wow, that's really interesting. I would, yeah, <clears throat> I think lots of people wouldn't really link the two but it's really interesting how you've shown that there is and what role do spiritual practices play in joy cultivating joy yeah. great great and, question and and how helpful are they yeah i've been talking um one of the kind of big projects i've been working on for the last three years is something called the character course which is an eight session course that, that basically teaches various positive qualities of character. So it was designed for churches. It's all free, uh, thecharactercourse.com. You can download the videos. This is my advertising pitch, it's crazy. <laughs> you can download the videos um, and all the materials there. And, and basically what happens is over eight weeks, I gave people sort of practices um, that, that were about learning, about hope, about gratitude, um, about love, forgiveness, persistence, oh, uh, humor. Issue with the... Network. Still got me? 
Sorry about that, slight technical difficulty, but we're back on track now. <laughs> Carry on, Roger. Yeah, so so I, I think at that point, Lou, people could see me, but not you. I believe that's what, so they would have seen me just sort of sitting here silently. <laughs> so, oh, well, uh, it's real life, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I was um, just really briefly explaining that I put together this this programme, the charactercourse.com, uh, and o over the course of the last three years, we did a research project in which about a thousand people did it. And we just looked at what the influences of doing those kind of meditative, prayerful exercises were. And overwhelmingly, the, the sort of response is the main thing that changes is that people's level of positive emotion went up. Um, so if you're practicing hope, gratitude, love, et cetera, that um, it, there's a lot of things that surprisingly didn't change. But the one consistent thing that did change is for people who practice those things, their level of joy, positive emotion went up. Um, so that's something people can look at. And they, that's charactercourse.com. They can look at that and uh, see what they make of it if they wish to. Great. That sounds really good. And I think maybe there might be people here who have um perhaps for the first time started to to wonder about the link between spirituality or faith and joy um and alpha is a course that we run as a church and it is well it's it's a great environment to explore some of these things just just why don't you just share a bit about your experience of alpha and how helpful you think that might be in maybe pondering some of these questions yeah. well, well what what i really like about alpha as a as a sort of introductory course to christianity if you like is that it's just really low pressure in the sense that i think you can kind of turn up you can make of it what you like um i think the christians generally are told to shut up and let people just <laughs> you know just talk over whatever they make of it yeah. um I, and it is a really really good place there thing if you're wondering is this, this the kind of thing that's for me then it's a really good place to go to experiment to check some of those things out and and just see what happens as a result um and so i i always feel like it, it's a great place for people who have questions and are wondering uh, to go because i know I, I i hate stuff that's really sort of precious and pressured and coercive i'm just not keen so kind of the, the idea that there is a course where people can go and ask questions and just wonder and see what happens that's great for me and um one of the things that i really like about it when i've done it is firstly you get a real sense of community because there's people all asking similar questions but also Sometimes I just get a bit fed up with small talk. And so it's nice to actually talk about something quite meaty. And whether you believe it or not, it's just nice to have some of those deeper questions, like what really is the meaning of life? And I think given that we know that joy can't necessarily be found in the shorter term pleasures on a long term basis, why not explore something that can? And so my appeal is if you're watching this and you are at all interested in the idea of spirituality or God and whether there is a God that is behind joy or life in general, then um, we would love to see you on an Alpha course. And if you want, you could just come to the first week and see what you think. We have one running on this Tuesday, the 20th at 7.30, and it's all on Zoom, which some people say is a lot better because you're not in the same room as people you don't know. You can, you've got a bit of distance between you and the other people. So I'd really encourage you to come along if you're interested. There's more information on Christchurch's website, um, christchurchlondon.org forward slash alpha. Roger, I've got another question before we finish, which is quite an interesting one. Um, is there a link between singing and joy? Oh, that that is a great one, uh, and um, of, of course there is. And um, but part, part of the, if you think about all our um, emotions are embodied, so uh, you, you know if you take on certain postures, you might feel certain emotions. Um, and, and joy, the the emotion that ideally goes with joy is jumping, you know, leaping. So if you jump on a trampoline. Or you do star jumps. Occasionally, you you activate joy in yourself, and, and if you really sing with great gusto, 
uh, and you really put yourself into you actually put yourself in that same thing you know you breathe right through to the depth of your diaphragm and therefore you're actually using it, very similar things to laughter you know it's, it has this very similar sort of breathing technique to what happens when we laugh in a really deep throated way um so yes there are there are and, and and i think experientially lots of people just experience joy don't they when they sing and, and particularly if you sing with other people yes there's been a lot about community choirs and things isn't there and the benefits of that yeah. and um i'm sorry this really is the last question but one thing that i really wanted to ask was about play and how kids are so good at play and as adults we I'm speaking very broadly and generalising here, but we often forget how to play. I just quickly talk about the importance of play. So, so what play does, um, I, and we we still have the capacity to play, play as adults, uh, and playfulness is part of our creativity. It's also part of our uh, ability to problem solve. Um, it comes up in our in our humour as well. So all of that has a playful element to it. And the thing about playfulness is that play actually sort of belongs to a slightly different world than the world most of us inhabit. So most of us inhabit what, what psychologists call a telic world. And a telic world is a world where means and ends, where you're thinking, I need to do this in order to do that. It's the world of the to-do list, really. Mm -hmm. Whereas the playful world exists in what some psychologists would call the paratelic world. And the paratelic world is the world that says, actually, maybe A doesn't lead to B maybe between A and B, I want to go via G, H, then to Z, then back to M, then to L. And playfulness has that thing that says, if I was going to do this differently, how would I do it? Um, and so it involves curiosity, it involves humor, it involves creativity. Um, I, and play, believe it or not, is one of only a handful of truly biological systems that are hardwired into human beings. Um, and it doesn't go away when we're adults. Um, so, so if you're beginning to think, I, I want to take a break, I want to do something different, what what playfulness could you bring into life? That, that's a good question to ask. That is a great question to ask. What do you do? What's your play? Um, well, I, I have lots of it. I mean, I, I'm very, very um, cheeky and mischievous. So I have two sons and there's all kinds of, tickle fights and um it, just before we came over here we we found this game called among us on um on the phone where you have little spacemen running around and one of them is a murderer but you don't know which one and so me all, all four of our family were all playing that just before this because it's it's a family game and we're all shouting at each other and things like that so i i mean i have to say if if i can find any excuse to play at any given moment that's what i'll be doing <laughs> That is such a good point to end with. It's a really good reminder that play is really good for us, isn't it? And it's there's nothing to feel guilty about or ashamed of if you take time out and do something really fun. Thank you so much, Roger, for all your wisdom. It's been so interesting to talk to you and hear about the topic of joy. I feel like we could have talked for ages because there's so many different avenues we can go down. Do you have any final parting thoughts? Uh, do, do you know the thought that's on my mind and it's it's a bit of a bit of a christian thought actually but you, you know there, there's one word that's used only of jesus in the bible and it's a greek word and it's the word um egalio and it basically describes um jesus leaping for joy um and um i think sometimes we have this idea of god being a bit somber and a bit serious and a bit sort of aloof and yet you have this kind of story in in the bible where Jesus is the only person that that word is ever applied to. And it's just this description of him jumping up and down in joy. Um, I, and that, that's just what's on the forefront of my mind as we're talking about playfulness. So maybe that's a nice thought to end with. That's a brilliant thought. Thank you so much, Roger. And thank you, everyone, for watching. We hope that you enjoyed it. The recording will be available on YouTube afterwards. So feel free to share it with any friends or family. Take care.